Hello and welcome again to Emergency Medicine Topics. In one coffee, I'm Alan Giles, an emergency physician, and today we're going to talk about supracondylar fractures in children. Okay, so first of all, let's just really briefly revise the anatomy. So, the bones. The humerus, the radius, and of course the ulna. The important vessel going down the middle is of course the brachial artery. And there's the ulnar nerve, there's the radial nerve, and the median nerve. Now, the actual supracondylar area we're talking about is here, I'll show you. So these are the condyles we're talking, and then there's the medial lateral epicondyle, and then proximal to that is the supracondylar region. And this supracondylar region is thinner, much thinner than, than the mid shaft. And this thin area is prone to fracture. <coughs> so how does it happen? Well, it's a fall on the extended outstretched arm. If I did that, I'd probably dislocate my elbow like this posteriorly. But in a child, and this tends to happen between five and 10 year old children, in a child, the capsule and the ligaments are much stronger. So the bone breaks because the ligaments sort of stay in position. Okay, and overwhelmingly, what happens is that the distal area of the um, humerus goes posteriorly. It's called an extension injury. You can get a, a flexion injury, that's when you fall on your flexed arm, but this happens only a couple of percent, say 5% of the time in supracondylar fractures. How do people with supracondylar, kids with supracondylar fractures present? Well, often they've got their arm in extension, and if it's displaced, they might get this characteristic sort of S-shape that's described. You may see that it's displaced, obviously. So what are your priorities in the emergency department? Well, they're gonna be in pain, so analgesia. I would use, I'd use nitrous, actually, first of all, with the idea that you use the nitrous so that you can put an IV in the other arm. Once you've got the IV in there, I would use increments of IV morphine. Let's talk about 0 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. Um, IV is a bolus to start off with, so for a, a 30 kilo child, that's sort of 1.5 milligrams. And you can repeat that again, and often by about 0.1 to 0.15 milligrams per kilogram, you've got sufficient narcotic on board. Once you've got that, then you need to examine the, the hand, and you examine essentially because you want to look at the perfusion of the hand and the fingers. How can you do that? Well, visually, of course, if it's dusky, that's obvious. Uh, if you've got, um, if you're very careful, you can feel the outside, using the outside of your hand, and just feel the temperature of one hand of the child compared to the other. If it's cool, obviously you've got decreased perfusion. You can check peripherally the perfusion by just squeezing that area and seeing what the capillary return is like there compared to the other side. And lastly, of course, you can just really gently just check to see whether there's a radial pulse and what the sort of volume is compared to the other side. The other things you'll be looking for is to see if they can make an okay position. So their arms out like this, whether they can make a, an okay, um, because that's looking at the median nerve. And the other one that you look at is uh, to see if they can have wrist and finger extension, because that's for the radial nerve. The ulnar nerve is not usually involved, not with the extension type of injuries. Okay, so we've examined the child, we've given some analgesia to them, and now, of course, we're going to get an x-ray. We may even put a little supporting back slab behind it, or sometimes they'll come in with an ambulance with a cardboard slab there, just held in the position, and that means that they can go to x-ray without moving, because the movement causes the pain. On the x-ray, you'll see whether it's minimally displaced or not displaced supracondylar fracture, whether it's mildly displaced, and, uh, uh, but it is still in contact, or whether you start to lose contact both anteriorly and posteriorly, or that it's completely out. Now these are uh, graded you know, type 1, 2, 3, 4. What I would do though is have a look at the x-ray and I'd take a photograph of it and I'd send that via my iPhone to my orthopedic surgeon uh, so that they're able to look at it also. 
um, I'll often take a photograph of the, the child's arm, especially if, it's, if the fracture looks displaced, so they can see clinically what the child's like. So, so we've got these different types of supracondylar fractures. We've looked to see the, what the perfusion's like. We've basically checked out the motor components of a couple of the nerves. We've got some analgesia on board. There's a couple of things which we need to, to, to talk about. One is, um, is the minimally or sort of not displaced supracondylar fractures. Because these are occasionally missed in emergency department. They're called sprains, a dangerous thing in, in uh, pediatrics. How can you suspect it? How can you decrease the chances of missing them? Well, if you look on a, um, on a lateral x-ray and you see um, a posterior fat pad sign like this, you'll be suspicious. That means there's blood inside the joint. You shouldn't see that posterior fat pad. It shouldn't be pushed out like that. That means there's been an intra-articular fracture, most likely, which supracondylar is one of those that could have caused it. So that should make you very suspicious. Anything else you can help yourself help with? Well, on the lateral x-ray, you can use the anterior humeral line, and the anterior humeral line we can just see here. Anterior humeral line coming down should go through the middle of third of the capitellum. This can be augmented on that lateral view with a line going through the middle of the radius, and that should cross with that anterior humeral line in the middle third of the capitellum. Now, if it doesn't, it means usually if, it's, if, that, um, if that cross is in the anterior third or even further forward in the capitellum, it means that that distal part of the humerus has gone backwards. There's been a fracture and been a displaced fracture. <clears throat> now, what happens with these sort of fractures? Well, most of the time, of course, displaced fractures will go to the operating theatre for anaesthetic uh, manipulation and anaesthesia. Uh, for minimally or non-displaced fractures, after a discussion with your orthopaedic surgeon, they may decide to have a back slab then going on to a full slab and be treated as an outpatient. But I would always toss it past the orthopaedic surgeon, orthopaedic registrar, to make sure you're both on board, not only about the initial treatment, but about what sort of appropriate follow-up for your hospital or your setup. Now, there is one other thing we should discuss. Under what circumstance should you manipulate sort of fractures, supracondylar fractures in the emergency department under deep sedation? <clears throat> and talking about the sedation, if I was going to do this, I would put them, we'd use intravenous ketamine. I think this is the ideal um, analgesic and dissociative anaesthetic for uh, this condition. So under what circumstance would you do it? Well, essentially, if you've got a critical perfusion to your hand, you've lost your radial pulse, uh, it's dusky, it's grossly displaced fracture, and there's going to be a delay to go into theatre, then, yeah, you need to manipulate the emergency department. But remember, you're going to need someone to hold proximally, you're going to have someone to go distally and manipulate that, that um, part of the distal humerus that's going posteriorly and push it back into position, and then put a back slab on, make sure that your perfusions come back, your radial pulse is returned, and don't flex it more than 90 degrees an absolute maximum. You'll also need to have not only those two people doing this, but someone giving the ketamine and someone keeping an eye on the airway. So we're talking about four people as a minimum for to do this, um, this whole uh, sedation um, effectively and safely. Okay. So we've looked at the anatomy, we've looked at um, had the presentation, the examination, we've looked at uh, the analgesia you should give, we've touched on the different types, we've talked about those um, minimally displaced or non-displaced ones that you can get tricked with, and we've just briefly talked about under what circumstances you should manipulate in the emergency department. Geez, I reckon that's just about enough for supercondylar fractures in one coffee. I'll see you next time. Cheers.